we have figured out the technology today. Uh, it's actually the last class we figured it out. So now you get these nice, big, huge slides. Right. Not difficult to read. Where um, am I? We hope, at least. Yes. Um, I found out something yesterday. I per participated in a webinar. Mm -hmm. Five minutes before the webinar, they sent an email giving you the link in case you can't find the original email that had the link. I thought that was so helpful. Yeah, that's a good idea, actually. A little reminder that we're going online. Not only is it helpful for those who are planning to come, uh, but those who might, you know, have a last minute opening. Yeah. And want to participate. But we just, we did get one of those just about 10 minutes ago. Well, there you go. Fantastic. I, I did. Brilliant. All right. I need to let somebody <laughs> in. All right. Is that Marsha? Who just came in on phone? Is it 3509? It might be Annie Kessler. Oh, good. Annie Kessler. Oh, it's 3590. I mean, three, five, that's the 350. Hi. The... Hi, Ann. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing? Good. <laughs> Hi, Ann. Hello. Before. Hi. Hi. <laughs> oh, hi. <laughs> A N N E or A N N? Forgot. That's right. With an E or no E? Yes, E. Got it. Okay. Okay. All right. Hello, everybody. Nice to see you. All right. So let me do one thing before we begin. Me too. Is this? All right, let us bless Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Haolam. Asher Kishanu B'mitzvotah V'tzibanu Sof B'dibrei Ola. Blessed are you, Adonai, sovereign over time and space, who makes us holy with commandments, commands us to engage in the study of Torah. And today we uh, resume our journey with Honey from the Rock and Rabbi Lawrence Kushner. This is a, a wonderful story-filled journey. Uh, a journey towards greater enlightenment and spiritual inspiration and a commitment to uh, learning about Jewish mysticism. So, everybody can see the screen? Yep. All right. So, let's see what happens. Oh, that yes. was Mike. Let's see. Let's see. All, it all went away. All this craziness just came. So what just happened? Let's stop share after all that. What is all this? Oh, goodness. I can still see it. You can see the, what can you see? Oh, I did. I was. Yeah, yeah I did too, and all of a sudden it went away. Okay. There it is. Yeah. Yes. Yes? Okay, great. Yeah. So, uh, we won't be reviewing this uh, definitional stuff every week, but I do think it's uh, it's meaningful to return to uh, Rabbi Shachet's uh, few bullet points that convey a sense of what Jewish mysticism is on a basic level. Uh, so we talked about how Kabbalah means tradition. The Kabel means to receive. And so uh, what we are doing here is practicing a way of receiving our tradition. And uh, this tradition has its roots at Mount Sinai, both as an historical event and as a public event. God enters into our history, creates a very loving gift 
the gift of Torah, Matan Torah, gives that Torah to us at Sinai. It is revealed. It uh, begins to be impressed upon our hearts. And so uh, this moment of revelation that brings us all together in connection with God and one another becomes the basis for Kabbalah. It's the basis for Torah, basis for Kabbalah. And uh, as stands to reason, uh, this historical and public event centered around this beautiful gift of Torah reflects the divine source, the divine origin, uh, the divine inspiration of Torah. Now, of course, the origin, you know, in God's hands given to Moses, the origin in Moses' hands given to uh, the people, either way, uh, God is central to the inspiration. Uh, and some, if not many, believe that God actually gave the Torah to Moses. I see a question already. Let's see, what do we have here? Oh, great. Oh, okay. Ellen, take care. Ellen can't stay, but she's happy to start and say hello. Uh, okay, so Torah then becomes the basis, the exclusive basis for Kabbalistic claims. And although there are individuals, there are rabbis and scholars who weigh in on the nature and purpose of Kabbalah, uh, Torah is the ultimate basis, not someone's particular worldview or perspective or beliefs. Clear? Yes. And the last piece here is that authentic Jewish mysticism is very much a practice of Torah. So it makes sense for us to, to bless La Sopi Divrei Torah because our foray into Kabbalah is ultimately a foray into Torah. Any thoughts or questions before we begin? Any at all? Let's see if I, I can't even see everybody at once. All right. Chime in uh, because I don't see everybody face once because of the screen being filled with text. Uh, just chime in. If you need to mute yourself because there's some background noise or whatever, please do. Uh, otherwise, if it's quiet like this, people can stay unmuted if you're not already. All right, so uh, reviewing some of the material from last week, we started with the first gate, the first portal, the first entryway into our spirituality. It is the doorway of the meat bar. The meat bar is the wilderness. The meat bar is the desert. And so I thought we would review one of the readings from last week to help us remember just how transformative a place the Midbar is in helping us truly jettison our slave mentality and to embrace our free person's mentality and um, the mentality of one who has impressed Torah on his or her or their souls. Okay, so, uh, Devorah, why don't you read for us, The Wilderness is Not Just. The wilderness is not just a desert through which we wandered for 40 years. It is a way of being, even if just for a moment, every now and then, each day, for it is the only way to begin. One who does not make himself ownerless, open like the wilderness, will be unable to acquire human wisdom or God's word. <clears throat> Excuse me. That is why it, what was said, that is why what was said was said in the wilderness, Sinai, Numbers Rabbah. And that must surely be why he brought us out here, out there. For there and only there might we be able to encounter the mystery. Okay, thank you. Do we know what Mitzrayim means? Yeah. Egypt. Egypt, but what does Mitzrayim literally mean? Narrow. Narrow. Narrow places. It's from the narrow places that God heard our cry, finally, after 400 years, and catapulted us through to freedom. And our landing spot was the opposite 
of narrow places. The opposite of a place where someone owns someone else. The meat bar is a place that demands freedom and demands a certain openness of heart to let the slavery go, to leave it back behind in Egypt. Not something that the, the desert will permit because in the desert we are ownerless. So then how can we be slaves? Well, the reason is because we can choose to want to be back in Egypt. Or we can choose to press on in this wide open space that enables us the room to acquire Torah and to press upon our hearts the wisdom of, of God's love. So in a sense, it's a way of being, just like slavery was a way of being. Slavery was a way of being, but we weren't free to connect with God or Torah. Being in the desert, however scary, also a way of being, rendered us ownerless open. It's an interesting phrase, ownerless open. Each of us is ownerless open if we choose to be, if we choose to recognize our liberated souls. That wasn't going to happen, by the way, if God took us up the coast, along the beach. Been great for a suntan, right? Be great for uh, a little rest on the beachfront. You know, it'd be great for feeling the sand in our toes, but we would not have really acquired that deep sensibility of being ownerless open. I have a question. Yes. Okay. So, at, is this directed to all the Jewish people or just the boys? Uh, well, uh, you're talking to me, right? I am. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> it applies to us all. Yeah, okay. Applies because to us I... all. Applies to us all. And thank goodness we were talking about this uh, in our life meaning class, in terms of uh, aspects of our theology that are really challenged by the language of Torah. Right. So, to the extent that we're talking about a freedom story, liberation from slaves, uh, slavery, and yet our tradition permits us to have slaves, even if you look at Things like Shemitah and Yovel, the Jubilee year, as moral innovations that set slaves free. The fact that we, uh, former slaves, could hold slaves is not only ironic, it's unfortunate. It's sad. Torah is uh, written in such a way that women don't always feel that they're standing at Sinai. And yet here we are on a journey. That requires all of us to be at Sinai. And so the language doesn't always reflect that. And yet we have to find a way to relate to our Torah so that we're all part of it. I mean, those are just two areas. Torah has a way of being very outspoken about certain aspects of life and our community and identity, uh, LGBTQ plus, uh, for sure. Um, hard to say in the um, in the actual language of Torah where people would fit in. So we have to rethink how we look at Torah so that we can make sure where we can be inclusive, where we demand inclusion, that we will be inclusive. And somehow our Torah will have to shape up and keep up. You know what I'm saying? Yep. So uh, any other thoughts or questions before we continue? Just one last line here that I want to focus on, and then we'll segue into uh, the next chapter about mystery sowed. So this sentence here, for there, for there and only there in the midbar, 
might we be able to encounter the mystery? Uh, you get a sense here that the desert is truly a mysterious place. And sometimes you look at a desert and the first impression is, hey, it's barren, it's hot, it's harsh. It's not a, a nurturing place. And if it is, then it all must be hidden. Well, actually, a close look at the desert recognizes just what a complicated ecosystem it is. But on first glance, we don't necessarily see that complicated ecosystem. Rabbi? Yes. What does L-O-C-E mean? Oh, that's just the uh, where I found it in the text location it's a it's a it's a kindle thing thank you it doesn't tell me what the page is in this particular book it tells me the location so uh you know a close look at the desert reflects its greater complexity but when we don't look more deeply into that complexity when we take a simpler view things are kind of hidden things are mysterious and what this sentence indicates to me is that the Midbar, however open it is, however nurturing it may be in terms of helping us jettison slavery and feel comfortable in our freedom and our liberation, so much so we can embrace Torah, impress it upon our hearts, imprint it in our, in our lives, utilize it to make a difference, be a force for good in the world. Uh, that journey is not always going to be totally visible to us. It's going to seem mysterious. And the desert helps us encounter that mystery. And so it's fitting then that we segue into the next part of our journey. And we make entry in or through the second gate, Hasod, the mystery. All right. Uh, Mary Lou, would you uh, read the first mystery? Okay, I, hmm. I can't see all of it. Oh, I, I, mean, I can make it, but. Well, you can move Let's the see. picture. All right. all right, I can move this picture. If you move the bar of pictures, you can move it around the text. Oh, the bar of pictures. Okay, that's so what that's I, oh, got it. Okay, got it. Okay. I all moved right. them. Good. First mystery. The first mystery is simply that there is a mystery a mystery that can never be explained or understood, only encountered from time to time. Nothing is obvious. Everything conceals something else. The Hebrew word for universe, olam, comes from the word for hidden. Something of the Holy One is hidden within. All right. Just a few sentences, but abundant with powerful meaning. This teaching suggests that mystery is essential to the very definition of the universe. It comes from the very same place. Olam is the world revealed to us, the world upon which we live and create and connect, but it also is a mystery. The desert from one perspective is a complicated ecosystem, but you really have to look hard to see that because that complexity in many ways shrouded by mystery. The world is revealed, the world is mysterious. It reminds me of those pictures that we saw, the goblet that can also be looked at as Two profiles, two people. I should have put that slide in here. Can't see both at the same time, really. You have to create a tiny little space to transition your mind and your sight from one picture to the other, from one reality to the other. Here, we understand from the outset that there's a certain mystery that leaves certain things hidden. And so, 
mysticism becomes the process by which we encounter this mystery. Perhaps to reveal that which is hidden, perhaps to recognize that there are certain things beyond our capacity to reveal. I think of Abraham Joshua Heschel, who was masterful in six languages, fluent, wrote beautifully. Apparently his worst language was English. It's pretty impressive. I don't think I could come near writing as well as him in English. And it's my number one language. Anyway, so he uh, was a well-trained scholar, signed to uh, uh, a Hasidic family. And uh, believe that ultimately there was sort of a ceiling of reality beyond which was complete mystery. We have the brain power to sort many things out in our lives, but there comes a limit to it. And beyond that limit is hasod. Beyond that limit is what is secret, what is hidden, what is revealed, what is not revealed. Thoughts, questions? Yeah, I don't get this. The Hebrew word for universe, olam, comes from the word for hidden. Yeah. Did I miss something? So olam, the is word this? olam is the word yeah. for world or universe. Right, right. And uh, Rabbi Kushner uh, tells us that literally the word olam, although we define it as uh, universe. Yeah actually it's a reflection, a more literal reflection of the word for hidden. What is the word for hidden? Uh, it's a Mastir. very reasonable question. And La Astir? Didn't La Astir? Look it up. Well, that's different. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't define it from a, from a modern right. Hebrew standpoint. I don't have a dictionary. Let's pause on that question. We'll do a little word study next time we meet. Yeah, right. that's why I didn't get it. Okay. I'll have some homework. I'll have some homework. Um, okay. So, uh, Olam, so shape, wear, form flows out of this hidden. older form of the word hidden. Okay, and uh, well, let's let's go back to um, the creation. What is what is the universe before the universe? It was kind of confusion. It was. Yes. It was Tohu Vavohu. Tohu Vavohu was chaos. It was the abyss. It didn't really possess God's light. Mm -hmm. It was sort of a darkness without God's presence and light, although it's a bit mysterious to put it that way and paradoxical because God is everywhere, right? So ostensibly, God is in the abyss. A rabbi? Yes. My favorite description is a mishmash mess. Mishmash mess. <laughs> Say that five times fast, and you will get a special prize. <laughs> mishmash, mishmash mess. So, one of the beautiful theologies that flows out of the creation story is that God takes God's divine light, which is different than sunlight, which is different than the reflection of sunlight off, say, like the moon. Uh, it is very different than human-made light, which is still a very, very powerful creation and invention. This is God's light, sort of the light that God wished to contain in jars in order to create space for the universe to rise. And then those jars shattered and the light shattered into a bunch of pieces, sort of the basis of tikkun olam, of repairing the olam, right? Repairing the broken world, or the broken light, right? That was revealed when the jars cracked. So uh, here, uh, the idea is that God's light flows through that abyss, that darkness. And with that comes this creation out of the darkness, out of the hidden, right? So the world's fundamental nature comes from a hidden place. Now it can't stay hidden forever, right? Why not? If the world is concealed forever and ever, then, you know, 
We wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be. There was nothing to talk about. Nothing happened. Right. The fact that uh, there's a certain amount of mystery that is revealed is, is why we're here. This is mysticism. Recognizes fundamental mystery, but also recognizes our capacity to look into that mystery, some of which we can reveal, or some of which God reveals. Now, I realize this is very abstract, mm -hmm. um, but I do think it is captured nicely. Uh, uh, is it Sima or Sima? Sima. Sima. Were you here when we showed you the picture? No, I you didn't like it. Uh, I can stop sharing this for a second. It's useful for a conversation. Uh, bear with me. Um, let's see. Uh, let's, let's not do that. Let's exit that. Let's go to this. Go to this. Okay. Uh, okay. 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 See this? I'm yes. Glad I'm added yes. Up. yes. So uh, we've looked at this a couple weeks now. This is a goblet. It's also profiles of two people looking nose to nose. True. And uh, human body will not allow us to see and process both at once. If you see the goblet, then you don't see the profiles. If you see the profiles, you don't see the goblet. Not at once. There's a mm -hmm. certain shift. Got it. There's a certain shift. There's a so small space that allows you to uh, see both fairly quickly, one after the other in succession. And then, of course, once you know that there are multiple realities in one setting here, then it kind of trains your mind. And you can kind of go, you can toggle back and forth between the two pictures as if there was only a tiny little space in between. Mm -hmm. Right. But this yeah. is to suggest that there are multiple realities at any one time. But while you're looking at one reality, the other one might be hidden. Making sense? Yeah. So the alarm certainly is revealed in many different ways. Right? It's revealed by creation of a sun and a moon, right? And an ocean and the land. It's revealed by the presence of plants and animals. It's revealed by the presence of human beings. It's revealed by the presence of Shabbat, a day of rest. All these things reflect a revealed olam. Even the midbar, for all its mysteries, is a place where we know that we can be owner open. open. Ownerless open, sorry. Ownerless open, we can be there ready to receive the Torah, which is revealed in the desert, in this place of mystery. That doesn't mean everything is revealed. That doesn't mean there's nothing that's hidden. That's part of it. Just as something's revealed, like the goblet, something's hidden, the two profiles. Okay, questions. Let's see. So, Yishi, what do you mean? Not if you don't look at either <coughs> Hashem. Explain, please. Interesting comment. Are you there? He's got himself muted. There he goes. All right. Let's stop share there. Yishi can't hear you if you're speaking. Still can't hear. Oh well. Let's see. We want to get rid of that. Uh oh. This microphone may not be turned up all the way. Okay. That's what I think it is. All right. Let us share once again. Back to our. Okay. Uh, you should do me a favor. If you have a point, and we'd love to hear it, perhaps you could make it in the chat.
Three, zero, nine, two. All right, three. let's. Okay, what do we have here? Yes. Yes. Not if you look at either. Baruch Hashem. Yes. I'm not sure I know what you mean. Oh, look at the screen with two objects in mind. Sorry. Yes. With the two objects in mind, those like 3D images. Okay. So, so maybe in, 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 in focus. Okay. All right. So what you're saying uh, is that when we look at a picture that is not more multidimensional, uh, we may not be able to uh, see images at the same time, but maybe in a three-dimensional setting or even more dimensional setting, we might be able to see a larger reality. Well, I, 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 listen, I don't understand the psychology of that per se, but I'll buy it as uh, an interesting possibility be interested to hear from a kind of a science -y standpoint There's what, what, what the process is that allows for that to happen. I, 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 I tend to, uh, I want to know. Quantum physics, yes. There's okay. something called persistence of vision, which occurs, I know, in animation and uh -huh. I think in, um, in 3D, too, where your eye holds something and gets something else, too. You know, how you think things are moving in animation. You're ah, holding okay. To one. Yeah. Great. So, so not only is it uh, in the realm of science, <laughs> you get this woman a prize. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> she thinks you should get a prize. Okay, good. Um, so, so not only is it a function of maybe a, a larger scientific understanding, but also one of graphic arts. Powerful. So uh, from our perspective or from our standpoint, based on what we're trying to learn, and science is a wonderful tool to uncover and reveal mystery, is it not? So uh, getting back to Heschel, I would say, Rabbi Heschel would say, yep, all great. All great, all the science, really important. Uh, and yet even beyond that, right, there's only a limit to how much of our brains we can use to convey this science, to convey these technologies, allow us to see more dimensionality at one time, right? Um, there's more to that. And that more to that equals hasod. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Did you see what uh, Yishi wrote to you, Marilu? Give this woman a prize. Ode to science. Womp womp. Okay, let's take what? a look. All right. Okay. So, speaking of dimensionality, uh, Sima, will you read this? There is more. Yeah, life is an illusion. There is more to reality than meets the eye. The everyday world is an illusion. It is really only the way a dream is real. We see it and we hear it, and indeed we live in it. <laughs> we stake our lives on it, and in an instant it is gone. So this is an interesting reflection. Yeah. I think about the world as we live in it today. Everyone here on this call is sheltering in place. It may feel surreal, and yet, I, I wonder if any of it actually feels illusory. There is a COVID-19 virus that is forcing our experience here. And so I think that there's something that's very real. At the same time, Rabbi Kushner indicates to us, the, Kabbal, uh, the Kabbalah indicates to us that there's more than meets the eye. And perhaps it's, it's, it's factored in, right, to that sense of illusion. I was texting with a friend who is running an online school. And she tells me that it is um, surreal. 
Like she can barely believe this is what she has to do. Do, do we feel that to a certain extent that this is all very surreal, that our lives are very surreal, COVID oh, yeah. or otherwise? How so? How do we describe that? A distortion of time. There's a, a distortion okay. of time in our days, in our nights. All right. I find that Monday through Friday feels like one long day. <laughs> now, is that true? <laughs> It kind of feels like that. Well, I mean, it's an, it's an illusion, right? Because given how we organize time, Monday through Friday is, uh, is what? It's five days. Each has 24 hours in it. Right. Based on our definition, that's what's happening. But there's something about the way time is moving, sheltering in place, that kind of blends it all together. You know, Why not Saturday and Sunday? Well, for me personally, Shabbat, Shabbat is working really well for me in terms of breaking up this long day. Shabbat breaks me out of the illusion for, a, for 25 hours. Okay. And Sunday? Sunday, uh, it's back to work. But you know what? Uh, it's a bit of a shit i have to like clean the house on sunday i don't want to hear any violins now <laughs> but i'm uh i'm doing a lot of things i don't do during the week uh like doing my part to keep our house oh, clean well, and as such make sure my wife is super happy <laughs> she's very happy when the floors are mopped and and the furniture is dusted. Am I? Yes. Um, for me, <clears throat> time seems to run together with one saving grace. And that is I tutor students on different days. And if I'm tutoring Brooke, it must be Tuesday. If I'm tutoring Nathan, it must be Friday. That kind of thing, which is really surreal. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, look, uh, you had a routine before. One that was tried and true and felt very real. All throughout that time, there were other realities that uh, remained hidden. In part because you weren't looking, in part because maybe you weren't dreaming, or you were thinking that your reality that is real is real and not some illusion or not some dream. And this is a really interesting philosophy. It's kind of telling you whatever you witness in the world, whatever you actually see with your own eyes and understand with your own experience in the everyday world is only real in the way that a dream is real. And what happens usually when we wake up from a dream? We forget stuff. Now, uh, Rabbi, what's the definition here of an illusion? I think the illusion here is that. Um, this is sad. Well, look, I mean, uh, remember, many of us are coming to this from a very rational standpoint, a very science standpoint, kind of what you mm -hmm. see is what you get standpoint. What is suggested here is that while you are witnessing reality from whatever perspective you're witnessing, there are other realities that exist at the same time yeah. that are hidden. It is also true that whatever you make of the reality in which you live, he's saying that despite the fact that we live it and feel it and are in it, when we wake up, there's part of it that is missing or gone ever um ever sit in a movie mm -hmm. right, and hear a line in the movie that really brought you to full attention and then the moment's gone you can't remember exactly what was said yeah yes and then yeah. and then more time 
goes, you know, you were, mo you were inspired by the moment, but you just can't figure out what it is. So, you know, you have to go back and watch the movie again. Right. Or I find it when I'm reading, uh, I am a tireless highlighter. And having Kindle makes it great because I can highlight in different colors. <laughs> but I, um, I can give you other colored highlighters. Yeah. <laughs> I like to highlight things because I might forget. And so I like to go back. Otherwise, it feels like a dream. The dream's over. I forgot exactly what was said. So uh, incidentally, I hope this, you already know this, but uh, this is, a, this is a, a journey into a very complicated and um, abstract subject. Yeah. And uh, I don't expect you to walk away from this experience uh, solely with uh, the purpose to embrace Kabbalah as your spiritual and theological journey. If it works out that way, great. If you find yourself confused about concepts or unsure what things mean, that's okay too. Trust me, uh, I enter into some of these teachings and I know there's wisdom there. I'm just not quite sure how to use it for myself. So uh, we can try and unpack these confusing things to the best of our ability. <laughs> Certainly, if we can't answer something in the moment, we'll look it up, right? We'll get that root, for example, for Olam. You know, uh, that part's easy. It's got to be Ayin Lamed Mim. By the way, if somebody wants to look that up online, uh, Rabbi Google's always helpful to me when I'm teaching. If somebody else looks up the answer. All right, let's go to the next one. A reality not seen. Let's see. Uh, uh, Iris, please. Okay, wait one second. I just, okay. You are watching television. Then you turn the sound way down like you used to do when you were a kid during the commercials and laugh at the funny lady whose lips moved without making any sounds. Then you turn the contrast knob so the speaker seems barely visible through some dark foggy mist. Then you turn the brightness all the way down so the screen is completely black. You see nothing, you hear nothing. But you continue staring at the black, soundless glass rectangle. For something is there, someone is speaking and looking. Only you can't see them. From within a darkened space, a message issues. A reality that will not be seen or heard or understood. Just as the eye will never see itself. But nevertheless, there is something going on there. So I don't know what that A is. It's a typo. Okay. Uh, uh, I want to pull up something that uh, John hey. shared with us. It's a French saying. Uh, John, I will uh, refrain. Ishi, I will refrain from speaking the French unless you can jump on and speak it for us and speak it so beautifully. But the uh, translation to the French is, when you don't ask me, I know. When you ask me, I forget. Sort of this elusive <laughs> reality, right? One moment you know, and nobody asks you for the information. And then as soon as somebody asks you, you're like, uh-oh. Yes. So whatever. Uh, Yishi, you'll have to share the French with us. So. You have to. Unmute yourself. <laughs> so, uh, what do we have here? Rabbi? It, yes. I have never, ever done this. I look at this and I go, what the hell? Why would you do that? Oh, on a TV? Yeah, <laughs> I've never done it either. <laughs> I've never done it either. And I've been watching TV for a long time. <laughs> okay. Well... <laughs> so, uh, so, you know, Rabbi Kushner is a unique individual. Um, I, I, I can remember playing with knobs. And uh, I could remember turning, uh, turning the contrast knob so that you have no 
uh, it's either dark or it's very light. And either way, uh, whatever's going on behind that screen is still going on. But depending on perspective, depending on how much contrast or how much brightness, right? You will see either a little or a lot. You will see something or you see nothing. Rabbi? Yes. I have a modern day equivalent. I tutor a student on Zoom and he loves to play with the buttons and he likes to change his um, background. And sometimes he disappears because the background is so dark, mm -hmm. but other times he's playing with the buttons on the keyboard and he turns his sound off and then he can't hear me. It's really interesting. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I think of the following statement um, about a tree falling in the forest, mm -hmm. right? See, so if a tree falling in the forest falls, right, it's going to make oh. a sound. Does it make a sound? It yeah. creates sound Does it make a sound if nobody hears it? Right. See, so here we have an interesting challenge, right? Probably mm -hmm. uh, on some objective level does make a sound. But hearing, in a way, can be a, a sort of a, an opportunity, a way of life, uh, something that can only be done if you actually are hearing something, if you're collecting sound. Rabbi? But then again, on some objective level, that tree is falling. And, and what we know about trees falling is that they make sounds. So on some level, in some cosmological way, <clears throat> The sound is taking place, and we may know that it's taking place. We just can't hear it. Or in the case of the TV, someone is speaking and looking in the middle of a program, but we have turned the sound down, or we have turned the light, uh, the contrast, the brightness down, right? Mm -hmm. And something's going on. We just don't hear it. Rabbi? We don't see it. Yes. I've gone a totally different direction. I'm, I'm thinking about all the people who lived during the Holocaust and saw and heard and didn't see anything, hear anything, because it's a willing suspension of, disp of, of disbelief. You just ignore it because you don't want to know about it. And then there's all the people today who listen to different um, media and they hear something and the other people don't hear it. Or all the people in the world, in our world, who don't have access to any of that information, but the information is out there. So look, whether you are in some form of profound denial because of the the, the terrible brokenness and, and horror that, that surrounds you. And somehow this is your way of, of navigating the awful moment or whether you're in some kind of echo chamber where all you hear is the things you want to hear. Uh, what mysticism seems to suggest is that despite blocking out all that sound despite narrowing your vision so that somehow you can cope and be resilient and live in the world that you want to live in, live in the world that you want to live in. Doesn't mean that there aren't realities that aren't happening at the same time. You just don't see them or hear them, mm -hmm. but they are there. I think that most of us understand that. Okay. I mean, especially today where we're aware of other worlds other countries and especially in this country these days i mean i feel like i live in a totally different reality from somebody who watches only fox news and i'm completely <clears throat> aware of that i knew we were getting there <laughs> I, I do think that these they do they are in a different reality well, the spiritual <laughs> value the spiritual value of jewish mysticism in this framework is that it creates a moral, spiritual, even intellectual discipline 
that recognizes that there are multiple realities at the same time. Some of which we are aware of, some of which are revealed, some of which we choose to ignore or deny, but they exist at the same time. Mysticism, Judaism is about paying attention and about revealing the unrevealed to see the holiness therein. Any thoughts? I had something. Can, can you hear me? Yes, yes please. Oh. Annie. I had something happen to me like a couple months ago before this whole thing that it kind of reminds me of this. Um, I was working at a construction site. I was just going to go measure some windows for draperies. And I was very careful, doing everything super careful. And then walking out of there, it was kind of, it, it was a construction site. So things weren't finished. Things weren't lit right. And I walked right into a glass wall. And my, like, my tooth went into my, you know, my lip. It was kind of scary. Oh. The yeah. whole, whole idea that that wall was there, it took me a while, like, to realize that there was even glass there because I didn't see it at all. It was so clear and so not seen. And so that reminds me of, like, that there is a reality that yeah. I don't see that could be there. And that's a really powerful metaphor. Mm -hmm. That's a really powerful metaphor a glass wall that you walk into because you can't see, but it's definitely there because you bump into it. Right? So the illusion is that there's a clear path. Right. Yeah. The reality, once you bump into that wall, is that there's a, there's a wall there or a glass <laughs> barrier. And it kind of thrusts you immediately into a contrary or a complementary, rather, reality. Contrary to, it's opposite of what you thought, but it is complementary in the sense that it's like, oh, well, what, uh, what else is new? We learned in mysticism class that there are multiple realities at any one time. And our opportunity uh, as Jews, ultimately, through study, through prayer, through tikkun olam, through um, building community, through doing acts of loving kindness, pursuing justice, is to pay attention to uh, a world that's still unrevealed. But if we were to reveal elements of this world, um, it would uncover the extraordinary. It might uncover the holy. So we're going to take a look at one more text. Um, uh, people have said that you know a good, strong hour is the way to go. And uh, so we're going to try and finish as close to 12 as possible. But this will be our last text. Um, and uh, we're meeting every week. So we'll get back to this uh, soon enough. And uh, let's see. Linda, please. The Baal Shem Tov. Actually, um, uh, read the, the, the text from Mishle, from, from the Proverbs. The glory of God is to conceal a thing. The Baal Shem tells of a king who was a master of creating illusions. While he wanted very much to be close to his people, he wanted even more for his people to be close to him. So he devised a plan. He built around himself a great castle illusion. The illusion, the illusion, illusory walls, walls <laughs> and doorways and towers. There were chambers of and courtyards and passageways. In front of each of one, each one, the king placed illusory treasures of every kind, bags of money, trips to Florida, and having a beautiful body. Then he proclaimed throughout the land that he wished to be found. And all the people came to the illusory castle, but one by one they gave up searching for the king and they settled for some illusory treasure until at last the king's son came. He saw that it was all a, an illusion and that his father was there in plain view, sitting on a folding chair in the middle of a great field. Keter Shem Tov, Jerusalem, 1968, page 13. 
the great question you see is whether or not this world is really real. If it is, then those who would search for some higher reality are mistaken. And if this wor world is illusory, but a screen for some higher order of being, then there is more to it to reality than meets the eye. And we have settled for some illusory treasure and giving up searching for the king. Religion is more or less organized way of remembering that every mystery points to a higher reality, a reality overarching and infusing this world of splendor, one pulsing through its veins, um, unnoticed and unnamed of the nameless one. And holiness is so holy that it fits even our everyday illusions with spiritual meaning. Okay. So uh, one thing suggested here, and Simic gets back to your point of concern, even sadness, right? If everything that we are living, however real it might be, is only an illusion, all the things that we've built up, all the things we've accomplished, all the good things that we've uh, done to make a difference in the world, if all that's illusory, then, you know, what's the point, right? it's mm -hmm. all fleeting then what's the point and yet we know a few things about life life doesn't go on forever there are mysteries well beyond our capacity to sort out despite all the wonderful things that we've done to evolve as human beings and to contribute to the world as a collective force for good all that is magnificent um, but it comes often in the form of materialism where we start to identify with the chambers and courtyards and passageways of materialism, of uh, body image, of <clears throat> acquisitions, you know, and we start to, to think that that becomes something ultimate about that pursuit. And in that pursuit, sort of a pursuit of idolatry, ultimately, that we forget that there's something bigger, something better, something beyond us, some higher power. That's the worry here. The worry is that we become too invested in what we think is real, that ultimately, uh, if not illusory, has temporary meaning. People say all the time, you know, well, you're not going to take any money to the grave with you. So practice tzedakah. Pursue justice with your generosity. All right? Because those material things are temporary. They're illusory. You don't take them to the grave. They're not going with you to the alam haba, the world to come. So how do we prepare ourselves ultimately to live a life of greater meaning so where we can keep those illusions at bay? Well, we understand that we live in a world where some of the most precious, most extraordinary things are, are hidden, and that through our religious practice, through our pursuit of spirituality, through our pursuit of justice and Torah and God, we can reveal that which is hidden. We can uncover those illusions and find the real deal, right? That the mysteries we encounter in life lead to God or lead to the higher power. This is a theology that I, I just want you to consider. Whether you embrace it personally or not is not my goal. My goal is to help you understand that this is a pathway that seems to suggest that what Judaism is, is a pathway to uncover the hidden and to reveal something of God's mystery that otherwise is unnoticed and unnamed in our normal pursuits of life. Questions, comments? So, the theology of this, uh, thank you, John. Baruch Hashem, Baruch Tiyeh. It's a lot to think about. It, look, the essential, the essential notion here is that uh, 
that the, the mystery takes us to, to the Holy One of Blessing. That the, the, the only reality that matters is sort of that pathway that takes us there. Everything else is an illusion. I don't know if I believe that personally, uh, because I think part of being Jewish is making this world count and putting the wor work in to healing the world, <clears throat> which I don't think is illusory. I think it is part of this process. So maybe that, maybe we're saying the same thing. Right. We're saying the same thing. But the problem with the castle, what does he call it? A castle illusion, the great castle illusion. Looks beautiful, promotes wealth, promotes power. But at the end of the day, it's not permanent. Even if it lasts a long time, it's an illusion. John's saying, Yishi's saying, uh, it's a lot, nothing equals all the same. As much as it is, it isn't. Same value to make it equal, yes. All right, friends, we're gonna pause for now. Uh, struggle on, not only with this material, but with life uh, and its illusions and its realities. Uh, for sure, one thing I don't want to be an illusion, I want it to be only, your only reality is that you are well and staying well and your loved ones as well. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Come again. Look forward to seeing you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. See you later. Nice. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.